the wolves came in and pushed the night fence down into the sheet. And I threw a spotlight on, they left. I think that was the one day I cried last summer because I was just like, I don't know what else we're gonna do. Like, what, what can't, we can't do anything. You just heard from Kim Kearns. She's a sheep and cattle rancher in Eastern Oregon. And she's talking about her experience living with her sheep in the summer of 2021 when they were dealing with heavy predation by wolves. This is the same rancher who experienced the first wolf depredations in Oregon in 2009. And as she and her neighbors continued having problems with wolves, they started night pinning their sheep behind an electrified woven wire fence. Every night we would go, because of how the wolves were acting during the day, they were kind of fracturing the edges of our sheep. And so at night you would jump in your pickup and you would go drive around um, on all the roads and listen if you heard any bang or anything seemed odd. And I was driving along and I saw something odd in the, just kind of in the forest, you know, 50 yards into the forest. And it was just kind of dark. And I go out there and there's a dead lamb. And I can identify this lamb. Like I, I know who the lamb is very specifically. She's out of a replacement ewe lamb that I really, really loved. And um, so I was like, ah, oh, crap. Visiting with Kim, it was clear from the passion in her voice that she really knows and loves her sheep. And we're not just talking about a handful of sheep. Kim runs a band of sheep. So her really knowing each one is a testament to how closely she cares for them. That's right, because typically a band of sheep is about a thousand ewes. And so when they have all their lambs with them, that can be a group of two to three thousand. And just knowing one of them, wow. That's a big task. When I found that lamb, I took like a little walk around just to see if I found anything else, but I didn't walk real far out there and I really wish I had because um, four or five days later we found the other eight that they killed. I finally was just like, I can't, we can't risk any of these dogs. Like we can't risk the guard dogs. We've already lost a lot of sheep. We can't afford to lose these sheep. Kim's story illustrates what it can mean for wolves to return to the American West. While events like these can be infrequent, most ranchers I've talked to say it's not if, but when. We have to learn how to manage our operations so that we can still be sustainable. And you know, that, that means economically sustainable also. In the Western United States, wolves can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. To some, wolves are a symbol of wildness. Wolves actually make it wilder. They make it more of the West. To others, wolves represent a very real threat to their livelihoods and well-being. I'm so incredibly frustrated. Um, I'm, right now, I'm just taking it a day at a time. It's the best I can do. Welcome to the first season of Working Wild University, a show where we explore what it means to share the working landscape with people and wildlife. We'll take you to working places within wild spaces at the crossroads of culture and science. In season one, we'll dive deep into what it really means to ranch with wolves. I'm Jared Beaver, Wildlife Extension Specialist at Montana State University in Bozeman. My position is split between applied research and off-campus teaching around human and wildlife related issues. And my personal background is with population ecology and habitat management of large mammals. And I'm Alex Few. I lead the Working Wild Challenge Program at Western Landowners Alliance. And before stepping into the nonprofit world, I spent a decade working for state and federal wildlife management agencies on endangered species recovery and carnivore livestock conflicts. So Jared, what are we doing here? What's the Working Wild U all about? Well, Alex, I think this show is about tackling the complex, nuanced issues that impact both people and wildlife in the American West. So what does that really mean to tackle nuanced issues? Great question. I think it really comes down to uh, a great story you once told me. You shared that one of your neighbors has a bumper sticker. Welcome to Wyoming. Now take a wolf and go home. What does that really mean? It's complicated. As a wildlife biologist, I hear take and I think lethal removal. Like I expected to see crosshairs on that bumper sticker. But if you were to ask him what that really means... He'd tell you that means 
Hey, tourist, why don't you take a wolf, go home back where you live, live with that wolf in your backyard, then we'll talk. So in short, why don't you walk a mile in my shoes? And in this season, we're exploring what it really means for people to share the landscape with wolves. So Jared, let's talk a little bit about the history of wolves in the United States. Sounds great. Where should we begin? In the early 1900s, wolves were systematically removed by way of poison and trapping from pretty much the entire United States, except for a very small population in northern Minnesota. And then, in the late 1970s, wolves started coming down from Canada on their own into northern Montana. And then in 1995, wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park and central Idaho. So here's Doug Smith, the leading wolf biologist at Yellowstone National Park. The plan was is to reintroduce wolves to central Idaho and Yellowstone because they were too distant from the source population in Canada. So the goal is to get those three populations going, we call them meta populations, and to have them connected through natural dispersal. So if anything happened to one of those populations, one of the others could rescue it. So while those first wolves were reintroduced into protected areas, biologists knew that for a wolf population in the Northern Rockies to become genetically resilient and healthy, these three metapopulations would need to connect, mostly by way of traveling through and living on farms and ranches in between the protected areas. So here's the situation. In some areas, wolf populations are well established, but in other parts of the West, they're just now gaining a foothold, right? That's right, Jared. They're now dispersing into parts of Western Oregon, Western Washington, into some parts of California, and Northern Colorado. It might come as a surprise to some to learn that in the Northern Rockies, approximately 96% of this wolf population actually lives outside of the protected areas, meaning they share the landscape with people and livestock. And that's where we're headed, into the working wild, where people and wildlife meet. If you're enjoying Working Wild U, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We would love to hear from you. And be sure to subscribe to Working Wild U wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks. Now back to the show. The American West is known for its diverse ecosystems, from the prairies and high deserts to iconic glaciated mountains. And these landscapes continue to support the timeless migrations of elk, deer, and pronghorn antelope, as well as movements of grizzly bears and wolves. And all of this wildlife depends on a patchwork of both public and private land that connect large swaths of open space. Private lands are the glue that holds it all together. And as we'll see this season, Wolves are highly social animals that live in packs with an average of 11.8 members, to be exact. Well, there is always a runt, and that doesn't count as a whole. <laughs> but in all seriousness, with an average litter size of five pups, wolves are an extremely resilient and adaptable species. That's right. Wolves rely on huge territories. The size depends on the density of prey. And they're territorial which means they defend their territory from neighboring packs. Or your dog. But in general, they mostly feed on ungulate species such as elk, deer, moose, and other hooved mammals. Like your livestock. And when so many wolves are on the same land as livestock, conflict is inevitable. Wolves predate livestock or go after the livestock guardian dogs that protect the herd. Right, wolves eat meat. Yeah, that's right. And even if they're unsuccessful... Their pressure can stress livestock, resulting in problems like lower weight gains and injury. And so here's Tom Berkmeyer, who we heard from earlier out in eastern Oregon. I noticed strange cattle behavior. They were in a spot that I never had seen them before, kind of that time of year, bunched up. And, and I uh, attempted to take them up a canyon. When I finally did force them up there, I found a calf that was dead. So that, that was the first one. That night we found another one. Um, and then it just began. Their wolves were right there in them, uh, howling. And challenges like this are not isolated incidents. We hear from producers across the West that predator conflict with livestock is now part of their daily struggle. That's right. 
And this creates challenges around time, money, and emotions. So what's the problem with wolves? Well, like I was always taught, the best scientific response is, well, it depends. And in this case, it really does depend on who you ask. This bill is nothing short of a declaration of war on wolves in Yellowstone and Montana. We do continue to have a problem, and I believe we have, you know, especially, like I say, in my area, uh, too many wolves. What is going to be the impact of this? This is going to be slaughter. This is slaughter of wildlife in our state. Well, they're just an apex predator that uh, depends on this landscape as we do to survive. All this has nothing to do with wolves. Wolves and wolf management has nothing to do with reality. It has to do with people arguing their values with other people. At the end of the day, how you feel about wolves depends on your values, right? As our society has become increasingly urbanized, many view wildlife and nature as something separate from people. But there is a big value difference between those who live with wolves on the ground and those who simply enjoy viewing them in places like Yellowstone. Like myself, for instance. Yep, and me too. I've experienced this value shift firsthand, but in reverse. I grew up in the suburbs of Houston, and I now live on a farm in Wyoming. And there's tons of research on what it means to have a value system around wildlife based in rural versus urban communities. Check out the show notes. So this shift in our society to more urbanized values has led to ideas like rewilding. And here's the definition from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary of Rewilding. Rewilding is the planned reintroduction of a plant or animal species, and especially a keystone species or apex predator, like the wolf, into habitat from which it has disappeared, in an effort to increase biodiversity and restore the health of an ecosystem. That sounds good, right? Right? It does. And it's not that simple. Here's Mike Phillips, who was the project leader for the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone, and he's now the head of the Turner Endangered Species Fund. I think rewilding means to put back, to put back native species. Some human activities have to change for restoration or rewilding to work. For example, you can't expect widely distributed wolf populations if you don't have minimal human-caused mortality. People have to change. Uh, I don't think they need to go away, necessarily, but they need to be more thoughtful. They need to be more accommodating. But even among scientists, there is not consensus. The widely respected wolf biologist David Meech once said, regulated hunting of wolves will not endanger the species again, but that habitat loss, especially the loss of large contiguous tracts of wild land, will. And this represents a broader disagreement, even in the international conservation community. A 2018 peer-reviewed paper suggests that conservation professionals agree on the challenges of coexisting with large carnivores, but not on the solutions. And this just goes to show that at a certain point, people's values come into play when it comes to finding solutions around wildlife management and human issues. So we just talked a little bit about rewilding. But there's another way of thinking about conservation, fostering a land ethic. We're talking about stewardship here, an idea popularized by Aldo Leopold, often called the father of wildlife management. Essentially, the idea of a land ethic is simply caring about people, about land, and about strengthening the relationships between the two. Leopold wrote, when we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And producers across the West embody this principle, often without even having a word for it. It's just part of their everyday life. They recognize that if they take care of the land, it will take care of you. And we should also take a moment to recognize that indigenous cultures all over the world have always been embodying this principle and continue to today. Here's Enrique Salmon of the Raramiri tribe of Chihuahua, Mexico. He chairs the American Indian Studies program at California State University, East Bay. When we, as Native peoples, look at a a landscape, it's also this recognition, understanding that my 
stewardship, my ministering to this place is crucial to its existence and its ongoing existence. In other words, the land needs us and we need the land. There's another piece to this story, though, another layer. Right now, more than ever, these wide open spaces are becoming increasingly crowded. They're being developed. Everyone is wanting their little piece of the pie, and it's gobbling up critical habitat and agricultural land all across the West at an alarming rate. And this trend is being accelerated by the ex-urban COVID migrations. But Jared, why should we be concerned about the loss of working lands? Because not only do these rural working lands and their stewards provide our food, fiber, clean water, and other important ecosystem services like carbon sequestration, they play a critical role in maintaining open space while also sustaining both people and wildlife. That includes the prey base that wolves need, like deer and elk. In short, they keep rural communities full of life, both wild and domestic. But the significance of working lands is part of a bigger story about our nation's food security. Here's Pat O'Toole, a rancher in Colorado, who recently provided Senate testimony. We also are about to do with agriculture what we did with manufacturing and let it go overseas. The numbers of, of food production coming into this country to take our markets has changed the fundamentals. And what our farmers and ranchers are trying to do is figure out how to be successful in the future. And to me, the thing that breaks my heart the most is hear a farmer or rancher say to their children, don't do this because there's no future in it. We have to turn that around. And if we don't act, we won't have farmers and we won't have rural communities. So on one end of the spectrum, you have people who want to remove all the wolves. But on the other extreme, you also have people that want to remove all the livestock. But as always... We think the solutions exist somewhere in the middle, where we can keep working lands working, while also supporting the wildlife of the American West. Because after all, we need private lands to stay open, to maintain open space, to provide connected habitat, and to sustain healthy communities. So we're asking the questions. What is the problem with wolves? And can we even create a shared vision of the future? So let's hear from Jared Talley an expert on environmental philosophy and governance from Boise State University who grew up in an agricultural community. He'll tell us more about how values intersect with defining problems. Different communities with different values will see the same situation as having different problems. Remember that assuming the problem assumes the values and we have diverse values and we need to think about that. So to recap, When we have a shared definition of the problem that integrates all of our values, we can begin to work collaboratively on shared solutions. You only get to share solutions when you have a common vision of the problem. Based on everything you've heard today, how do you think we, our listeners, you and I, the people we've interviewed, would define the problem? So when I think of problems with wolves, I think of conflicts with people. It's all about people. I think the biggest problem is, is a, so, a people social problem. It's an ecological problem. It's also a social problem. The controversy and conflict is on the human side. It's human values. It's human disagreements. So it sounds like everybody's saying people. And I think what that really means is that we, people, don't have a shared vision of the future. And the truth is, we don't really agree on where wolves should be, where livestock should be. And we don't agree on how wolves should be managed. Problem is, we just don't agree. Yeah, and and part of this problem is that we don't all recognize the value that working lands provide to society and to wolves. So how do we tackle that? I think it starts by listening. And collectively defining the problem so that we can get to solutions that work for everybody. And that's why this season we're connecting you to the humans of the working wild the people who live, work, and recreate in working wild places with wolves. So join Alex and I for episode two, where we'll start diving into this problem by reckoning with the history of land management in the West. We'll see you there. (laughs) 
Working Wild U is a production of Montana State University Extension and Western Landowners Alliance, with support from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, Western SAIR, and listeners like you. Today's episode was directed and edited by Zach Altman and produced by Matthew Collins, Zach Altman, Alex Few, Jared Beaver, and Abby Nelson. Our hosts are Jared Beaver and Alex Few. Lewis Wirtz is our executive producer. Music is from Artlist and Blue Dot Sessions. Follow Working Wild U on social media for updates and explore our show notes and bonus content on our website at workingwild.us. Please consider rating and reviewing the show on Apple Podcasts and share this episode with a friend or neighbor. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.